Today's session is 2020 Outlook, Travel Recovery Trends to Watch. As a reminder, this session will be recorded. If you're using social media, we invite you to share some of the things you're learning with the hashtag TravelConnect2020. You can change the layout of your screen to either focus primarily on the person speaking or in grid mode with the options on the top right of the main display. If you have any technical difficulties, please feel free to reach out via the chat function. Lastly, please submit your questions via the Q&A feature for an open discussion at the end of the session. Seven years ago, ARC created the Travel Connect Conference to bring together those who connect the world for meaningful conversations about the trends shaping our industry and the future of the travel. With the devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on nearly every travel stakeholder around the world, the needs of our industry have changed. Although we made the difficult decision to cancel the in-person 2020 Travel Connect event, we believed there remained a need within the industry to continue connecting, conversing, and collaborating, now more than ever. To that end, this series was created. Beginning with today's session, ARC will host virtual Travel Connect episodes and events throughout the remainder of 2020 and into 2021. They will allow us to discuss the underlying opportunities that continue to propel travel forward like shifts in retailing and distribution strategies, or the need for a more sustainable ecosystem, while also allowing us to hear from the new voices and address the new acute challenges we collectively face at this specific moment in time. While the topic of today's session is an example of the latter, we will also make sure to get to some of the former. Today, we're gonna to focus on a single question, the one that's on everyone's mind, including mine. When will our industry recover and what will that recovery look like? There are so many variables shaping this, the spread and severity of COVID-19, government regulations on travel, consumer and economic sentiment, traveler behavior and cultural norms, all of which vary by which part of the world you're looking at, and all of which can shift with new learnings about this novel virus. There's no quick and easy answer to the question of how and when air travel will return, but there's a lot of data that can show us where the green shots of recovery are which we can analyze, learn from, and adapt to. We're excited to share some of those with you today, as well as the trends that you can keep an eye on to help determine the best actions to take for your business. Human nature is predicated on interac interaction and exploration. We are a social species who craves to see, learn, and connect more. People will travel again, and we'll be there to connect them. Joining us today are three travel industry data experts, Glenn Branscom, project leader for BCG, Chuck Thaxton, managing director of data science for ARC, and Rick Sini, CEO of Three Victors. I am your host, Peter Kane, director of marketing strategy, content and brand at ARC. Our three panelists will be sharing insights from economic and consumer sentiment, air travel ticketing demand, and search behavior. Additionally, they will be discussing and showing a tool these three organizations collaborated, collaborated on it's called the Travel Recovery Insights Portal. It's a free public resource designed to help the industry better understand, track, and adapt to the evolving nature of travel's recovery. We'll be sure to provide a link at the end. With that, I would like to turn it over to Glenn, who will tell us about what BCG is seeing in terms of current economic and consumer sentiment trends. Awesome. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Peter. Yep. So as we, uh, broadly, we are, we are thinking about the economic response to COVID in three phases. Um, uh, on the, and, and if we move to the next slide, I, I, the uh, three phases as it relates to both economic activity as well as uh, the folks affected by the virus. And, and so that's the flattened phase, which is effectively what we all experienced uh, March, April, early May. Uh, economic activity shuts down completely, uh, stay at home orders in place, uh, and the entire idea is to slow down the virus as much as possible. It comes the fight phase, and this is this is in relation to businesses starting up um, and government starting up, and less in relation to uh, the family dynamics that might pop up as you've been in quarantine in the same household 24/7. Um, but this is the phase that we, we find ourselves in now. Uh, businesses starting to spin back up, um, governments um, trying to figure out ways to open up. Uh, internal travel, domestic travel, uh, as well as some international borders um, in, in the next 6, 12, 18 months uh, before a cure is found and, and we move into the, the future state. Uh, 
And the question here is really, you know, how deep are we going to go uh, and what will the shape of the recovery look like? So on the next page, we, uh, there, there's three generally uh, shapes that we think about recessions taking. The first one uh, is a V-shape, sort of a dip and a quick rebound. This is what we experienced in 9-11. This is uh, what we saw in some of the other virus progressions, like SARS, for example. Um, the U-shape, this is more what we saw in the Great Recession of 2008, where there's a dip, uh, and then we actually never get back up to the, the original line that we were on. Um, and so there's that period of lost productivity, and then, and then we never actually get back up uh, and make up for that difference. And then the last, uh, the last shape that, that recessions typically take um, is the L-shape, where you, you have that loss in productivity, um, but then over time you continue uh, to not make up and, and run parallel uh, to the line that you were on previously. Um, and, and BCG's macroeconomists at this point are, are looking at a lot of signals and believe that the main risk that we're looking at right now is, is U-shaped recovery, similar to 2008, where the, we lost a lot of productivity in March and April uh, and, and into May, um, but believe that long-term we're going to end up on the same trajectory that we were on uh, previously. However, my wife, for example, uh, left the job in early March in, in one of the worst timed job changes ever, left the job in toilet paper uh, and moved to restaurants. Um, so you can imagine that not all industries are gonna be impacted the same year. I can say that from, from personal experience. Uh, so on the next page, it, it's, it's pretty clear uh, that travel and tourism as a sector is just hit much harder um, than, than a variety of other sectors uh, in, in the economy. And so here, you know, we've got the VU and L shape that we introduced on the previous page, but also uh, a, a zoom in here of the prolonged U and the L shape. The prolonged U is similar to the U, just takes much longer to recover. Um, and, you know, we've, we've spoken with many experts, done some, several surveys. In general, it's looking like the travel and tourism sector is, is trending much more towards the prolonged U and the L shape. Um, this is looking at 24 to 48 months potentially to get back to where we were in 2019. Uh, and this is, you know, again, basically at this point, I, I think a coin flip between which of these we will find ourselves in. Uh, and it just depends on how, how effective uh, we are in opening up in a way that we don't introduce uh, a slew of new risks for the virus to spread, how, how quickly we see consumer confidence come back, which we'll talk on in a minute. Um, but in general, we're looking at the uh, prolonged U and the L shape. So this introduces a ton of really critical questions on the next page that, that travel and tourism um, companies are, are having to face. One is which geographies are going to be most impacted. This is something that obviously leisure destinations, Miami, Vegas, et cetera, are gonna be much uh, impacted much differently than say in New York or San Francisco. Um, how will consumer shopping behavior change? Um, so I, I know Rick from Three Victors, who's on the line, talks about uh, how typically customers uh, shop based on uh, price, convenience, and loyalty um, when they're shopping for leisure, and then those in reverse uh, when they're shopping for business travel. And it, it, it remains to be seen how, how the consumer behavior changes in this new normal that we find ourselves. Uh, the travel suppliers, how will travel suppliers respond? Um, there's been a ton of shifts in uh, network capacity that we're seeing across airlines. Um, and so obviously this has huge implications um, for, for the travel and tourism industry. And then structural changes, we haven't seen these, uh, too many of these yet, uh, but as we come out of this, will, we, will there be consolidation, uh, mergers, et cetera? And so uh, in order to help the industry uh, think through these problems um, and these questions, BCG and Three Victors have pulled together the TRIP dashboard on the next page. This is a, a publicly available dashboard. At the, if you haven't gotten a chance to see it, um, we'll, we'll make the link available at the end of the presentation for everyone to take a look for themselves. But uh, the, the idea of the dashboard is to pull together relevant data from across the purchasing funnel. Um, and so what you're looking at here is uh, the, the portal homepage when, when you access the link. Um, and there's data all the way at the top of the funnel on market landscape. Uh, OAG provides data on airline capacity and network shifts. Then the ability to travel. Uh, I know 
there are many places on the on the web to find uh, information on the COVID progression, but the government restrictions are, are included here as well from the Oxford uh, Travel Restriction Portal. Um, in the interest uh, section of the funnel, this is where I'll spend the next few minutes. This is based on um, BCG's proprietary data uh, around consumer sentiment. So there's been several surveys that have gone out to get a pulse on how folks are feeling about uh, a number of topics broadly, but um, around how they're feeling about the economy, their personal spending, uh, and their sentiment towards travel. Um, and then there's additional data here uh, provided by ARKIN3 Victors uh, on search and, and purchasing that will really help uh, address some of the questions around where is demand coming back, how quickly is it coming back, and some of the trends that, are, that we're seeing there. And so for, uh, for the next few minutes, I'd just like to, to walk through um, some of the information that you, that you might find interesting in this consumer sentiment section uh, as it relates to travel and tourism. Um, and on the next page, one of the interesting things that we're seeing here is that even though in a lot of geographies, we're starting to see the, uh, the number of cases slow down in China, for example, you know, we haven't seen uh, a new, there have been almost no new cases since uh, late April, um, but folks still really feel like their daily lives have been disrupted. So in, in the middle, these are people, uh, respondents to the survey um, that, feel like their daily lives are still disrupted. And in China, notably, still almost two thirds of respondents are saying that their daily lives are disrupted by this disease, even though it's been several weeks since they've had a, a new case, um, which is somewhat interesting to just think about the, you know, the, uh, it, it may not be just a quick on off switch um, once we're able to get the virus under control. Another, another interesting thing to think about is, uh, as we'll take a look on, on some of the other pages, I think people in general are, are optimistic um, and are really anxious to get back to traveling um, and their old way of life. Uh, but concerns around uh, the economic impact and fallout from, from everything that's happening is, is really driving folks to, to, to think about reining in their spending. And so here across countries and across geographies, we're seeing that a lot of consumers uh, are really thinking about sort of cutting back on spending and particularly within the travel category. Um, and, and so that brings us to the next, uh, the next point, um, the next page, sorry. Uh, travel and tourism has been impacted in a much more meaningful way than a lot of the other sectors. Um, this graph, for example, uh, shows a consumer's concern about getting the virus when performing, you know, a, a variety of activities. And you can see on the far right at this point, um, and generally, respondents are feeling very comfortable with online shopping, uh, are becoming more comfortable over time um, with ordering food uh, for takeout, et cetera. But over on the left, you'll notice a lot of travel and tourism activities that people are feeling very, still feeling very anxious um, about getting sick and getting the virus, uh, traveling internationally, taking a domestic flight, visiting a casino, you know, still within the 40, 50% range of respondents in the United States are concerned about getting sick during these activities. Now, that being said, uh, if we look at the next page, um, consumers are indicating an increasing willingness to engage in travel and tourism activities. So this, this graph is for each geography, the United States, uh, France, and China, whether or not folks would feel, or what, what it would take to get them on an airplane um, in, the next, in the next month. And the, the lowest bar down there at the bottom is, is throw caution to the wind. They would fly no matter what. It doesn't really matter if there's health and safety measures taken uh, by the airlines. And then that, that what I think is very interesting uh, about this is um, the, the green bar at the top, um, which is nothing would convince me to fly in the next month. Uh, and it's decreasing over time. And so there is this increasing portion of the population uh, that is, indicating that they would be willing to fly if airlines took specific health and safety precautions. Um, one of the things that we're noticing that's in the dashboard that's, that's popping up more and more uh, is, is this proof of health. And so, yes, sanitation practices, yes, the HEPA filters um, on the airplanes, um, but also more and more people would be convinced to fly if there were particular 
uh, proof of health. Um, similar to if you're going to the hospital now uh, for, for a non-emergency, you are required to, to have a, a, a COVID test ahead of time. Um, that, that is the sort of health and safety measure that, it, that people would feel comfortable getting on an airplane um, to do. Um, one thing I didn't mention, uh, but, but I, I'll, I'll mention, um, is on the previous page, the uh, concerns um, over time. Um, sorry, the, the concerns with each of the, the travel activities is, is actually correlated with age as well. Um, so roughly 30 to 40 percent uh, on average are, are concerned with getting the disease uh, for various travel and tourism um, activities. However, this is increasing uh, with age. So the younger, younger generation, uh, 20s and 30s, 30s and 40s, uh, are, are less concerned with getting the illness uh, in, in these different activities versus the 55 and plus. Um, and there is a clear correlation between age and disposable income. Um, so just, just another thing to keep in mind uh, that you know, the folks that have the most purchasing power are also those that are the most concerned um, about getting the, the onus. Um, and so there's, there's two questions. Are these concerns among travelers or all kinds of people? This survey is uh, broadly consumer, uh, is, is a broad base of consumer sentiment. I think down at the bottom, um, the, there, there's information on the, uh, the exact population that was surveyed, uh, but it is consumers in general. Um, and the survey goes out uh, to ask questions about a number of different sectors, not just specifically travel. Um, and then the other question, uh, will there be a slide deck after, available after the webinar? I'll, I will leave that up to, to Peter to answer. Um, and do you have any correlation with flight time, uh, meaning more likely to take a flight that is one hour long versus seven hours long? Uh, again, I'll leave it up to, to Chuck and Rick. I think that there's a lot of in interesting insights that are coming out of the search and ticketing data, um, and I don't want to ruin the surprise there. Uh, so if there are no additional questions, I'll pass it um, over to uh, Chuck and Rick to walk through some of the ticketing and search data. Thanks, Glenn. Yeah. Really appreciate that. And um, I think it provides a really nice overview and backdrop for what Chuck and Rick um, are going to get into. So now I'm going to turn it over to Chuck, who's not only going to give us some insights into ticketing data, but actually take us through the trip tool a bit. Um, so almost a mini tutorial for the folks uh, on the session. So Chuck, take it away. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, I'm going to go through a little bit of information uh, about what's happening right now. Um, Peter and Glenn both mentioned the Travel Recovery Insights Portal, which is an online tool that we've collaborated with Three Victors and BCG to create. Um, I'm actually going to walk through some of that live for you. Uh, to give you a little bit of a sense for how to navigate the tool, plus show you some of the latest information that we've seen on the uh, ticketing trends and the uh, airline travel demand data. Um, real quickly, what you see in front of you is the Travel Recovery Insights portal. Um, very simple navigation. There are tabs across the top. There is also a quick drop down on the list that shows a lot of detail information about what Glenn was just going through. Uh, as well as what uh, Rick and I are going to be showing you. So for the sake of time, I'm going to jump right into this and look at some of the recovery trends that we're seeing on the uh, airline demand side. This particular screen shows uh, the demand trends in uh, decreased demand year over year, as well as week over week. And what you see on the left side chart is demand universally is down. There's no surprise there. So year over year trends for airline demand by country are down in the neighborhood of 85 to 95%, depending on geography. However, there are some green shoots of optimism here in that a lot of these countries are showing positive week over week trends. And we have seen this for a couple of weeks now. So consistently, we are seeing week over week improvements in air travel demand. Um, to make this a little bit easier to look at and to go through, I'm going to pick uh, several countries here, uh, United States, let's pick Korea. 
And what that'll do is filter out the information for those specific countries. And what that shows us is in those particular countries, with the exception of Brazil and South Korea, we are seeing some material gains week over week. China specifically is leading the way. United States is doing well as, as, uh, at about a 2% week over week gain. Couple of other things that are uh, interesting to note here. The domestic travel trends are improving much more rapidly than international travel trends. Um, there's a couple of different reasons for that. One is uncertainty across the rules that are implemented differently across regions and across countries. Uh, people are concerned about being stranded, not knowing what the rules are, those kinds of things. So uh, universally, we are seeing domestic travel pick up more rapidly than international travel. The other thing that we see here in the middle is on departure date trends. Um, toward the summertime in June and July, we are seeing some good improvements. You'll notice May over here on the right side of this chart. May travel is very strong week over week. That is primarily due to a very short advanced purchase time frame. If people are compelled to travel for essential travel needs, that advanced purchase is usually pretty short. And that's what we're seeing with this May travel being, uh, being so good week over week. Now, if we look at things like the domestic travel versus international, let's, let's go to another chart here. Um, what this line at the top shows you is domestic travel in blue and the international travel in green. Clearly the domestic travel is recovering more rapidly than international travel. And we see that across several different dimensions. The other thing that we see on this chart is you'll notice as the COVID uh, cases increase, travel was decreasing. So these are sort of mirror charts in that travel demand is gonna go down as the cases went up. We are starting to see those cases decline and travel is gradually improving. So we're hopeful that that, uh, that will continue as things go forward. A um, couple of things I would point out here. Let me let's look at round trip travel for um, just the United States to give you a little bit of a sense of what's happening into the future. Um, looking just at near term travel, say in May and June, you'll see that domestic travel is clearly up. We see some day over day volatility, which is normal in our industry, but still gradually increasing as you. As you progress toward the end of the year and look towards, say, uh, September and October, you'll see those trends start to go up even more. What this tells us is as the year is progressing, travel is continuing to show a fairly steady increase. So even though domestic continues to lead the international, that domestic travel recovery toward the fall time frame versus near term and the summer time frame is increasing much more rapidly. And that's a good thing. It's approaching that 50% down year over year number. The other thing I would point out here is this is a metric showing the number of tickets sold. This chart also can show ticketed nights, which is a reflection of length of stay. The ticketed nights metric or length of stay is improving more rapidly than tickets. What that tells us is the average length of stay is longer than it was last year. Typically we see longer lengths of stay for leisure travel. So this is another indication from several that we've seen that leisure travel is going to lead corporate travel in the recovery. For a lot of reasons that's happening, people have pent up demand. They didn't take their spring break and summer vacation and want to get out. Uh, plus there are some economic downwinds for corporate travel recovery. That's still gotta come into play and that will uh, lag a little bit on the corporate travel recovery side of things. Um, moving on to sort of outlying travel or the travel by travel or travel by travel month. Um, this shows, let's go back to tickets for a moment. 
If you look at all travel globally, and the data set that we're looking at here is for um, travel across all countries and all regions and points of sale, we are seeing that gradual upturn toward the end of the year. Uh, I'm not too worried about November because that is so far out. The data is pretty sparse at this point, but month over month, travel is getting better, travel demand specifically, as we approach the outlying, outlying months in the year. And that's a good thing. We'll also see this average year over year change is around 79%. We've dropped below the 80% threshold. That's a good thing. But that line is gradually trending upward. As Glenn was saying a minute ago, it may be more of an L-shaped recovery, and that's going to take a while to recover, but we are seeing a pretty good trend for that. The other thing I'll note here is if we change this over to domestic, those numbers for domestic travel are improving as well, and a little bit better than the international side of things. Looking at the United States, if we just want to look at one specific point of origin, look at domestic travel in the US, that is showing a pretty good, pretty healthy increase um, toward the end of the year. So again, looking at this across a number of different dimensions, whether it's travel date, ticketing date, that sort of thing, we are still seeing some very good incremental increase year over or week over week as well as month over month. The other thing I'll point out here is uh, this is domestic travel from the US. If we go to look at international travel, it again is not occur or is not recovering as quickly, but even international travel specifically from the origin of the United States is not always the same. If we look at travel from the United States to Mexico, for example, in the early fall time frame, that international is recovering relatively well. Whereas if we go back and look at something like United States to China, that is not recovering very quickly for all sorts of reasons. Uh, the DOT announced today they're still struggling with some of the Chinese airlines allowing uh, those flights into the U.S., while U.S. airlines have not started flights back to China yet, that regulatory restriction will continue to depress this China demand going forward. So this is an example of the Travel Recovery Insights portal that we've got out there. Uh, you will get the link to this portal at the end of the at the end of the session. It is live, we update it every week. So I encourage you to browse around and uh, take a look at the latest information that we, uh, that we provide out there week over week. With that, kind of in summary, I'm gonna release this and um, give it back to Rick. But while Rick's uh, coming online here, just a couple of summary points. Uh, the travel demand that we see is recovering week over week. Slowly but surely, we're starting to see that recovery. Travel domestically is leading the recovery versus international. And ticketed nights is improving more rapidly than just ticket sales, indicating length of stay is increasing and leisure travel increasing at a faster rate than corporate travel at this point. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Rick and let him talk about some of the search trends. Rick? Good day, everybody. I guess that covers morning and evening, depending on where you are. Um, I'm going to be the one here today during this webinar that's teaching you how to be a data scientist for the next 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so we'll join with that um, as well. So um, ultimately, if, if we could uh, bring up the first one here. Hopefully, there we go. Um, my name again is Rick Sini. I'm the co-founder of a recently venture-funded startup, uh, Three Victors, which is a big data travel AI startup. And I'm going to talk about search trends and or shopping trends. And before I dive in it too much, I wanted to make sure that sort of in the funnel, as Glenn described, they've got a bunch of stuff on the high-level part of that funnel, including sentiment and the ability to travel, for example. 
Chuck's been on the very bottom end of that purchase funnel with the ticketing data. This sits sort of in the middle and a leading indicator um, of what's going on with searching. And then at some point, clearly, if you can use that ratio between searching and booking, you'll get a little better idea of whether or not they're just looking or they're actual buying. So. With this slide, I'm going to also dive in because the tool itself, and I know many of you are playing with it right now already because I know there's a ton of folks on this particular thing. Um, I'm going to show a little city level data. The tool itself is country level data, but I thought um, I had a two or three cities um, on my radar here that have come up and I get tons of questions on. I thought I would bring them up here. And so on the right hand side, you're actually seeing a graph of Las Vegas. So in this case, the search data comes from essentially people all over the world on apps and websites, essentially typing into a quote box, I wanna go from A to B on these dates with these number of people, and the list of offers and op options that they see coming back. So that's a single search. So pre-COVID, we were getting in somewhere close to a billion. If you do the math, it's about 13,000 a second. We have this history back all the way to the beginning of 2018. And what you're seeing here in this particular graph is last week's data compared to the previous week. And this is this, this previous Sunday. And you can see these are all cities, essentially. This is a same tip, similar type of graph that's in the tool. On the left-hand side is the year-over-year -year stuff. Um, and you can see I put a, a cheater line there at 50% because if I put it at 0%, everything would be below the line. And then on the right-hand side is the short-term, which is the week-over-week -week stuff. And so you'll see, for example, there's some good um, – city activity around that. So pre-COVID, 1 billion, and then an important part of this search data and what you might not know about this search data is that over two thirds of it in many cases is actually non-human activity. And if you go to the bottom graph here on there, and I know it's gonna be hard to see, so you might, you'll get it hopefully uh, in more detail. Somebody actually shopped Cleveland to Las Vegas 318 days in advance, and that ended up generating 32 queries on a variety of sources. That was probably a meta search site, maybe kayak or something like that. That ended up being actually one user intent. And before I jump into these particular cities, I also wanna talk about the, the analytical leaps that we're gonna be making along with this search data. When we combine it with the tickets, um, we can get that search to ticket ratio, which actually is sort of like peanut butter and chocolate. Um, combining them together is actually much more intuitive on some things that are going on that, that's coming in the near future. Also, I, I noticed there are a few questions about segmentation, business and leisure. There's a ton of work being done on that. Although there is some complication there because a lot of leisure travelers are acting like business travelers waiting to the last minute. And then, you know, Chuck mentioned ticketed nights on his thing. A lot of people are actually buying split tickets where they have round trip intent, buying two one ways separately. There's a lot of work being done so that we actually capture that shopping intent as well. So I'm gonna jump right in here to Las Vegas on this next slide a little deeper and talk specifically about Las Vegas. So same graph, exactly the same thing that's there. A couple of things to note here. Um, large international cities are the ones that are challenged into Las Vegas. Now, if you see, that's the bottom left-hand quadrant of this graph. You see Seoul, Vancouver, Toronto, London, Mexico City, Guadalajara, for example, all lagging behind. In many cases, that's related to travel restrictions. As, as Gwen mentioned earlier, there's a nice tool uh, as part of that that actually shows you what can and can't be done from certain countries. Um, an interesting thing that I saw on this graph almost immediately why I picked Cleveland um, was as soon as a state or even a city opens up, literally the next day we see demand actually increase in shopping. Um, so in this case, Cleveland, Nashville, um, Atlanta, Georgia is one of the first ones to open up. Detroit, uh, Denver, for example, Detroit just recently uh, opening up in, in some cases. So it's really amazing to watch these cities, if you look at this in a historical view, actually start to migrate up into this upper right quadrant um, of there. And then also, also notice that sheltering in place cities also lag in this kind of display. Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Jose, San Diego, and Mexico City, for example, are lagging in this display. So I think I'll jump into a second, I wanna jump into a, comp, a eye chart of slide, which is something that I'll, I'll go through and I'll kind of explain this. This is actually Las Vegas year over year. The top half of this graph is 2019, 2020 below. So the first thing to notice on this thing is, is that in 2019, we note that um, 
Las Vegas itself is pretty much not a seasonal market in the sense that shopping demand is the same across. Now, each one of those colors represents the shopping behavior all the way up to the final departure day of that month. So blue, orange, red is May, June, July, August, September, October, November. And this is a typical pattern you would see in a typical year. That spike there was actually an additional source into the search data. Um, so that's something we're working on normalizing out some of that data. But what you see is this typical pattern is you'll see it go pretty amazingly straight kind of up in a logarithmic fashion. Then as you hit the month, you're traveling in as the number of days that you can purchase tickets for gets less, it sort of tips over um, in those particular cases. Also notice this sort of sine wave, um, which is typical shopping pattern of um, shopping mostly the peak time around Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, and little or uh, much lower shopping on the weekends, for example. So you see that pattern as well, of sort of week over week. Now, on this graph, on the left-hand side, you'll see the scale is 800,000 searches at the top. In 2020, the scale is 140,000. Now, both of those are a little bit skewed because of those spikes, but just generally, that means that we have one in three people actually shopping that were shopping at the same time last year. So that's clearly a problem. It, that previous graph showed that as well. Um, on that graph, also you can see in the 2020, you'll, you'll be asking what the spike is right there in the middle. That's the actual announcement of the travel ban um, between Europe and including the United Kingdom a few days later. And you can see people actually exchanging their tickets and because each one of those lines represent a month as it as it actually happens, people were shopping to exchange their tickets in different months of the year. And you can see that spike and bubble in the middle. Of course, in the case of May sitting right there, you can see that big drop off. Here's the good news, June, July, look at that nice peak going up between those, it continues to go up in a pattern, albeit at a third of its previous level. Um, the one thing too that's interesting about this graph is you see these nice sine wave patterns in 2019 and you see the week over week stuff on the bottom graph, it's pretty choppy. What that tells me as I look at the data is, is that each individual city or state or country that comes online, the day that it does, or maybe there's a special announcement that you can get to the airport, people start shopping on that day. So they're not shopping in typical patterns, they're shopping on news. And again, again, we'll be working on the next steps here. These same graphs with look to book ratio, which also carries a lot of signal in it. And then once we get uh, into the recovery, we can start to use price because price actually includes many signals like supply and demand, competition and fuel prices. So when we start to show some of that, we'll see that as we get out of this. So let me jump right into my second city that I always get asked about, and I'm gonna jump right into Orlando. So Orlando, same graph, big difference really than that in Las Vegas. Um, you can see in the lower left quadrant, South America hovering at the bottom. These were really big shopping places into Orlando, especially um, you know, for the House of Mouse that's out there. We got Rio, Sao Paulo, Brasilia, also um, Bogota as well in that list sort of lagging behind. I'll note that the size of these circles on these graphs is the relative volume of searches that are out there. Um, so the bigger the circle, the bigger the, the city and search volume. So some of the smaller ones probably aren't as important, but the bigger ones definitely are. And you can see, for example, Detroit up in the top actually doing well, Denver. Um, also, we noticed too, in the area of Orlando, you have Montreal, Ottawa, Calgary, Vancouver also lagging into um, into uh, Orlando, and then on the on the opening domestic cities, we do see Cleveland, Detroit, um, Kansas City, Denver, Dallas, um, Albany, uh, Buffalo, for example, which is in upstate New York, which opens up a little bit earlier, for example, and then that. And, and by the way, uh, probably nobody here wants to challenge me on airport and city codes. So if you do, you can go check out my article on ABC News on that. <clears throat> and then shelter in place cities still lagging. Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Jose, San Jose, San Diego, Mexico City, again to Orlando. Um, so I didn't want to have this completely be data around US centric or North America. So let's jump to something I saw actually um, late this past week as the Germans all decided they wanted to get some sunshine as Spain began to open up. 
So what we here is see is the same sort of graph with Mallorca. Now exactly the same graph. Everything's in the right quadrant. Great short term, week over week. Um, clearly, there's still some problems. You're looking at you know negative 80, negative 85 percent on the year over year. That's you know essentially one in seven folks actually doing the shopping. But a good nice week over week short term demand jump. Um, again, with that 80 percent, it's still got a tough challenge on those comps there. Um, but then the interesting thing to watch on this is these large city breakouts. Like on the right-hand side of this graph, you have Madrid breaking out, huge jump, almost doubling um, in search volume week over week and jumping up and almost back to where it was before. Munich actually jumping back almost to where it was the previous year, that previous week. So that's pretty amazing to, to see that. And then also Dusseldorf, although week over week, not so great, year over year, pretty good. And then again, some domestic short term leading the uptake. We got Madrid, Barcelona, Valencia, for example, jumping in there. So with that, I'm going to um, potentially take some questions. I'm happy to answer some questions. Um, shopping data is a great leading indicator and its velocity of data also is on a daily level. So it's pretty useful to use in these city to city use cases. Great, thank you so much, Rick. That was really, really insightful. Um, what I'm gonna do, I have somebody from my team who's kind of organizing all of the questions into some uh, into something more meaningful than me just sliding through um, the Q&A, but I do encourage everybody else uh, to continue to push your questions into the Q&A and we'll try to get to them um, as best we can. Before Q&A, um, I do wanna provide this link and we'll share it with everybody um, afterwards as well. Uh, this is how you get to the tool. So it's, uh, you just simply visit on.bcg.com slash travel recovery and Glenn can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm fairly certain um, it could be uppercase or lowercase in the travel recovery um, to make it easier for folks as they try to navigate over there. So with that, let's um, jump into some questions. Rick, um, Chuck, and Glenn, if you want to come back and we can take a look at your faces. And um, folks, if uh, uh, on the call, again, if you want to put us into grid, grid mode, there's a little icon on the top right of the main of the main view. So great. Um, first question, um, there's some clarification around the ticketing data and there's two that's a little combined. I'll send this one over to Chuck. Is this new ticket sales or are these reissue of credit vouchers being used for the future? The data that we've got in the, in the uh, trip dashboard right now is primarily new sales. Uh, the reason that we're identifying new sales is it's the best way, especially in the very short term, to identify demand trends. Uh, if we fold in refund data and exchange data and that sort of thing, it sort of overwhelms the uh, demand data because of the level of refunds we've seen over the last several months. So right now it is initial sales. So these are sales that are made for travel during this period and uh, for travel in the months that we specified. Great, thank you. And are the ticketed metrics taking into consideration the passengers still booked for travel between September and December who have not necessarily canceled? Um, yeah, if, if we've got travel, for example, in September or October of this year, and that ticket was issued in January or February, those kind of things, that is included in the data. Um, if those tickets were issued and they are planning to travel in outlying months, that's definitely, definitely included. Um, one other thing I'll note, Peter, is we looked at a number of markets, China, South Korea, that sort of thing. The data that we've included in the tool is global data from the ARC Global Ticketing Database. So it is not just US point of sale. We've got China point of sale, Korea point of sale, pretty much every country in the world. Uh, is included in the data. So it's a pretty comprehensive view of what's going on around the world. That's great. And that's that's in that that's indirect sales, correct? Correct. Correct. Okay. Um there was a question about the spike in domestic ticketing data in March. Um here it is. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a couple of things I'll note and, and Rick alluded to this as well. Um the data that we're showing in the tool uh, does provide daily information. So as we have daily information provided, you will see some discontinuity and some spikes for a couple of reasons. 
Um, as airlines continue to uh, provide waivers on things like cancellation penalties and allowing exchanges, those kinds of things, um, you will see some of those spikes. Uh, the other thing is we saw a spike in March, uh, specifically for a couple of the US domestic airlines when they first announced waivers of change penalties that actually spiked some demand. People were saying, I can go ahead and buy a ticket now for travel later, and there is still an opportunity to change that ticket in the future if we need to. So as airlines continue to stimulate demand through a number of different, uh, different mechanisms, we're gonna see some of that spike, uh, but overall looking at those long-term trends, they are all fairly, uh, fairly positive at this point. Great, thank you. Um, for Rick, um, two questions that kind of go together. One is what is the source of the data in the three victors set? Um, and then to what extent can that search data be used to start predicting recovery? Yeah, so the, the source data is mostly from major GGSs. Um, that's the core of the data set. There's also some other data that gets mixed in along with it. Um, we're hoping over time, as we get more flows through NDC, for example, to include that as part of that. The data, we're, we're really, you know, the company was founded on this real-time principle of getting the data in real time. So generally, we see this stuff with about 20 seconds lag um, coming in. And that's, so ultimately, we want to be able to react to those things in real time. So the data itself um, comes from that source. And again, think of the data as what was typed into the quote box and what they saw in the result page uh, comes with it. So there's, a, there's the shopping and the pricing component that comes with it. The pricing's less of an issue during COVID because everything's pretty cheap, um, but that will have some signal in it. And what was the second part of your question? Um, so that, yeah, it was just simply to what extent can that search data be used to start predicting recovery? Look, I mean, we think this is one of the leading indicators, especially on a city by city basis, as you start to look week over week, there's tons of data showing, you know, exactly what cities are coming online, which ones come, what parts of the world are coming online. Um, it's a pretty good predictor. And, you know, when we combine that up with the ticketing data where we can put that in the denominator and we have this search to book ratio, we kind of have who are the tire kickers and still kind of worried, but still shopping, for example, but are buying. Um, and on the flip side of that, we can do so, a lot more better predictions around those things by looking at that kind of data. That's where sort of the the, um, the chocolate and peanut butter combined is where really the the signal is. And, that, and we're working feverishly. And, and by the way, I, I, I should have mentioned this while I was discussing it. I want to thank the folks at Airline Reporting Corporation and Boston Consulting. This tool was pulled together, and I know a lot of people are out there punching around on it right now. Um, in less than three and a half weeks since the inception, with a group of almost two dozen people pulling all these data sets together, and um, pretty amazing tool on the three victor side and our staff, ECG, and the ARC staff. So I want to thank everybody for that as well. Yeah, absolutely. It was a Pretty massive team effort. <laughs> um, for Glenn, uh, someone said um, they're 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 married to someone who's a MD and PhD, and they're concerned about a second wave. And so, is some of your analysis over at BCG taking that possibility into account? So the economic uh, recovery uh, assessments are certainly taking into account a variety of factors. I I've got to tell you, the lawyers at BCG uh, are certainly hoping that I don't say too much here um, regarding forecasting uh, the disease or or the economic activity coming out of this. So, um, you know, it, it, I think it is probably too soon to tell um, just in terms of all these cities starting to come online. Um, and I, I think that we'll probably have a lot more information uh, on that front in the coming weeks. Uh, but Peter, I, I apologize. I'm, I'm probably going to have to punt that one um, to avoid getting myself in trouble. Totally fair. Totally fair. Um, a couple more that have come in. Um, and I'll I'll open this up to all three of you. What do you think are the three most important or key or interesting takeaways that we've seen thus far in the past couple of weeks? Now that there's been some movement. Yeah, Peter. I I think the, the biggest takeaway that we've seen on the ticketing side is kind of the, the segmentation of the recovery. We see domestic recovering more quickly than international travel for reasons that we discussed, uh, but we're also starting to see leisure travel kind of lead the way uh, over corporate. So I think that's an important takeaway as we start to look at how things are going to evolve and recover. 
Um, it's going to be a little bit uneven across different channels and across different markets, but those are some uh, some clear indications that we're seeing on the demand side at this point. And, and I'll jump in. I, I, one of the things that I found to be really interesting is this last minute demand um, being much closer to where we would see it year on year uh, versus further out demand. Um, obviously, a number of different factors, consumer anxiety, uh, the yield curves potentially staying relatively flat, uh, and uh, you know, last minute prices being a, a little bit more palatable um, and, and easier for the leisure, leisure traveler, for example. Um, but it, it has been very interesting to me seeing the shift uh, in consumer behavior towards this really last minute um, purchase behavior. Yeah, I think I would echo that with Glenn too. I think the the blending of sort of a leisure traveler, which I think Glenn mentioned before, we always kind of look at price convenience and loyalty for leisure folks and, and a convenience loyalty and price for business folks. Without the price component being part of it, it's there the behavior is changing in the sense that you see all this close in shopping uh, and then you know i'm always on the watch for example in north america for christmas and, and thanksgiving and we've seen some perking up in christmas and thanksgiving time too summer not so much i guess you know people i think may think that they're going to be or at the time over the last several weeks might be locked up a little bit longer in some of these shelter in place orders and i know that a lot of them are getting relaxed nowadays but um, I think short in and a little bit longer out, that's where we're seeing at least some perking up. And essentially, whenever a city or a state or a country opens up, almost immediate jump from those particular cities. It's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I, um, I have to admit, I think a lot of that Thanksgiving search was me being very, very <laughs> impatient. <laughs> We'll, we'll remove you as non-human robotic activity. <laughs> I'm a bot, yep. <laughs> um, there's a couple of questions regarding the business versus leisure and how are we, how is the tool making, is the tool making that distinction, like, and how they're kind of con turning into like a one at this, you know, that makes sense at all. Yep. Well, one of the things that we've done, Peter, is started to take a look at a distinction between business travel and leisure travel. Um, We've got some things that are that are sort of in the lab at this point that are going to be a much more precise sort of profile, if you will, of this is likely a business trip or this is likely a leisure trip. Um, challenges there is, as, as I think Rick was alluding to a minute ago, um, those profiles are changing because of the you know, situation with advanced purchase and travel restrictions and that sort of thing. What would typically characterize a business trip in 2019 is probably going to be adjusted or changed completely in 2020, at least for the, for the next several months. So we're looking at calibrating our models more rapidly in order to make that distinction. And hopefully we're gonna have that available in the next uh, couple of weeks. Yeah, I would echo what, what Chuck's saying too. I, we're working on some modeling around that and even including, for, for example, time of day of shopping, for example, with timestamps, looking to see what times of day, for example, folks are shopping, um, can also be a signal into whether or not it's business and leisure, for example. Well, we can't hear you, Glenn. Just adding one last point regarding the consumer sentiment. The GBTA uh, released a study recently that uh, half of companies are considering resuming travel in the near future. Um, and Skip's got some pretty good information on this as well. Uh, what is interesting coming out of the consumer um, insights work is that you know folks are really itching to get back into their leisure travel activity. It's, it's one of the things that they highlight most uh, that they miss about the pre-COVID time. Um, and they also indicate that they are getting more and more used to working from home and that their, their companies, uh, for example, are, are figuring out ways uh, to, to work around not traveling, um, which obviously has some implications on the business leisure split uh, in the future once we start to come out of this thing. Um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, one, one question I really like here, and I'm going to put you guys on the spot. Um, can you provide a use case for your tool? Like, how could I leverage it as a travel agency? Yeah, what, l let me throw the first, uh, first swing at that one, Peter. One of the things that we've got within the tool is um, the ability to look at what's recovering more quickly than what um, is still lagging. Rick's got some of the similar stuff on the shopping behavior. 
so that travel agencies can take that and use that to sort of predict demand, if you will. Where should they put marketing efforts for travel to a particular destination or possibly from a particular destination? So they can use it for that sort of thing. The other issue is some of the BCG information on consumer sentiment. Um, Delta Airlines had an event yesterday and United had one earlier in the week. Uh, American has had those as well that talk about the safety features that they are implementing at their airline. The consumer sentiment data that BCG has within the tool says these are things important to travelers. Marrying that up with what the airlines are doing will give travel agencies the ability to build confidence among their travelers that they can actually travel and travel safely and that will just uh, encourage people to travel and feel comfortable and confident in traveling safely. Yeah, I think I would dovetail with Chuck on that too. I think if I was sitting there, one of the things I'd almost immediately look like look at in the tool is the departure month information. Where is it that I should be shopping for you if I'm if I'm doing it at an agency or what what should I be offering to you? <clears throat> if I was sending out emails, for example, or or if I was an online travel agency or something, or if I was sending out push notifications in an app. I think that kind of information is quite useful to because it's already in their mind already exactly what um, and you're seeing sort of this, what I'll call the wisdom of the crowd as part of that data. And the wisdom of the crowd can help you sort of help the folks that are your crowd in, in this particular case. Yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. Um, last question, because I want to do a little wrap up. Um, and Rick, there's a, some questions around clarifying like the non-human behavior now that I'm also a bot and like, what is like kind of, <laughs> a little bit deeper on what that actually is. Well, I, well, there's, okay, so it comes kind of in three major flavors. Um, I feel like I'm an antivirus company now, but um, one of them is a simple, th think Skyscanner and Kayak, right? A user goes in, I want to go from A to B on these dates. Kayak then makes an API call to 15 different agencies. Okay, so now you have 15. Uh, the GDS has returned 200 itineraries, but they really want to return 600, so they make three requests, um, for example, um, to a particular GDS. So now, you know, that one query turned into 45 queries, essentially. Now, it's sort of like the tide, and then you also have a lot of people scraping websites for competitive intelligence, for example. Um, and literally, in, in some markets, that non-human activity is over 70% or higher. And so that true signal is something that you really want for your, your marketing and ad tech application, for example, within an OTA or a meta search site, for example, airline, for example. Well, I learned something. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, thank you so much. Um, this was a fascinating session. And, um, you know, I think that, again, I... I'm looking at the tool every day and even I learned some things today, which was exciting. Um, listeners, I ask you to please follow ARC, BCG, and Three Victor Victors across our social media channels. Um, we're providing regular data updates, um, other content that's available from, from the three organizations um, that'll help, I hope, help navigate the, the your own recovery. Um, in August, we'll be back with another session. Um, we're going to focus on how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the business travel experience um, and the systems and processes that you know, travel is really built on. So we will email you when registration opens, but um, look forward to having you all with us again in, in August. Um, and I guess lastly, we're exploring ways to take these virtual um, events kind of to another level. So we don't want to just be four of us talking at you. We want to provide attendees with opportunities to network, to chat and connect um, with their peers, just like Travel Connect was originally designed to do. So I look forward to seeing you all again in August. Um, again, the link uh, we will send out after the uh, after the session, but for now it's um, on.bcg.com slash travel recovery. And um, again, if you want to join in the conversation online, uh, feel free to use the uh, hashtag TravelConnect2020 and visit us at arctravelconnect.com. So thank you again um, to our panelists and thank you to all of you out there um, who spent the time viewing today. Have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>